another installment in the Komen Orange County series, Caring Through COVID-19 Together. And today we are gonna be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on state policy, specifically around patient access, as well as just updates to uh, the advocacy work that Komen is doing at the state and federal level and any, all, any and all other information that our incredible expert guest is gonna share with us. Uh, my name is Megan Clank, and I am the CEO for Susan G. Komen Orange County. And uh, this platform has just been so important for us uh, to be able to come together, to stay engaged and stay connected, and importantly, to stay informed. And so we're very, very excited that joining us today is uh, Kelly McMillan, who is an, a lobbyist with Political Solutions with their healthcare team. And Kelly, aside from having great taste in the color of tops, <laughs> truly has a lot of expert knowledge to share with us and has uh, been serving California through her nonprofit management and advocacy work for over 20 years, focused on women's health and has been a champion for breast cancer patients, domestic violence and sexual assault survivors, and uh, California's underserved communities. And uh, so thank you for that work, Kelly. And in 2019, joined the Political Solutions team as a lobbyist, providing advocacy and lobbying services to multiple healthcare clients uh, in the nonprofit and private sector, including Susan G. Komen, which is perfect because uh, Kelly is also part of the Komen family. And in 2012, and began her tenure with Komen as the executive director for Susan G. Komen Northern and Central California affiliate and successfully led that affiliate through a significant merger, uh, including a 29 county expansion. Uh, it's just incredible to think about. And uh, during Kelly's time with Komen, uh, she also served as the state chair of the Komen California Public Policy Collaborative Committee and led advocacy efforts for six years at both the state capitol and in Washington, DC. And through your leadership, Kelly, uh, pretty incredible, uh, helped Komen pass uh, some significant landmark bills uh, through 2016 and 2018 that have benefited California's breast cancer patients. And so we are very, very honored that you have taken some time out of your busy schedule in Sacramento uh, to join us today and to share some uh, really uh, important information for uh, everyone interested in breast health and this breast health community. So welcome, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Megan, and, and thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity. Um, yeah, I, and I am part of the Komen family. I will always be part of the Komen family, near and dear to my heart. Um, some of the best moments in my career were at Komen doing public policy, and, and it continues to be an a, a important focus for our firm and for me personally. Um, and as you mentioned, I was chair of the collaborative, and um, Ambrosia now is also co-chair from the Orange County affiliate of, of the um, of the advocacy work that's done in the state of California, which is really important. And I wanted to talk about kind of um, what's happening in the legislature as far as uh, this pandemic, uh, the actions that the governor, the legislature is taking, and how that impacts um, patient access, and especially breast cancer patients, and how are we looking at serving uh, folks that are being diagnosed during this time or going through treatments. So um, I, uh, just to kind of give an overview at the beginning, um, on March 4th, Governor Newsom declared a state of emergency in California because of the pandemic. And um, is immediately our governor took a very strong and proactive stance on, on this pandemic and started um, press conferences that he has held every day, except I think his first break was Easter. And in those press conferences announcing 60 different actions, including 32 executive orders. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of his executive orders, but I kind of wanted to lay out the ones that address the healthcare arena and also the changes that have been made because of this pandemic with, with patient access. Um, first of all, the governor set up a, a team effort uh, working with our Department of Public Health Services, Secretary Mark Alley, and also the Department of um, Healthcare Services um, and all the different departments working very, very closely in, uh, together to make sure that they're on top of this, of this uh, pandemic. The California Department of Public Health has been an amazing resource as far as information and statistics and, and guidance for, for our healthcare services. Um, 
uh, on March 12th was the very first executive order from the governor declaring um, social distancing measures, um, foreseeing what could possibly happen in California if we didn't do that, and we're seeing that come to fruition. Um, those measures were put into place, but also along on that executive order was um, the opportunity to loosen up and make us more nimble when it comes to healthcare, as far as licensing requirements, um, opening up the, the opportunity for more people to serve, and also changing through a waiver process, rules and regulations that allowed us to be, to quickly uh, respond and to be nimble in the state of California to, to respond to the, to the crisis. Um, four days after that executive order, the California legislature um, met and in a bipartisan measure passed unanimously a bill, um, it was uh, uh, SB 89, that gave the governor a billion dollars to fight COVID-19. And then they adjourned and they haven't been back um, until right now we're looking at possibly Monday, May 4th. There has been some special sessions and I'll, and I'll get into that. As far as the executive orders regarding patient access that have happened out of those 32, I want to talk a little bit specifically about some of the things that have happened um, from the governor's office to serve our most um, underserved communities. Um, one of the things that happened um, right away was the governor asked the feds to um, allow our Medi-Cal patients to have telehealth services covered. Uh, was not covered before. Also streamlining enrollment and presumptive eligibility for Medicare so that we could get more people into the process and get them covered, especially for 65 and older and disabled community. Um, they eased up on uh, rules on prioritization and also allowed testing and services for COVID-19 free to that community. Um, these all went into a waiver process, and then about a week later, the California, or the, excuse me, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services (CMS) approved most of those waivers. Telehealth services um, have a long, long been an, uh, an advocacy effort for those that were trying to serve the underserved, especially in the rural communities that didn't have access to healthcare centers. And so, telehealth now um, has hit, on a federal and state level, there's been significant changes, which has provided more access. Um, and also it's, it's social distancing, right? You're, you're, you're getting service, you're getting, um, uh, be able to talk to your doctor and, and you're not compromising your health in any way by doing that, but it wasn't covered by insurance. Now it is on March 24th, uh, 21st, the governor expanded, um, the, uh, telehealth services by mandating that um, all healthcare plans, managed healthcare plans and commercial plans cover telehealth services, including mental health services, which has been really important during this time. People are feeling very stressed out. People are feeling very uneasy and the mental health services um, access through the telephone has been um, a great, great service and a great opportunity. Um, to back that up, the California Department of Insurance um, came out and also demanded that insurance, well, suggested that um, insurance covers, covered telehealth, but also they did something really important that Coleman Advocacy has been working for for a long time. And that is to um, open up the opportunity for people to get the medications that they need. So the California Department of Insurance um, removed the barriers for outpatient prescription drugs, um, allowing refill periods uh, immediately and supplies for 90 days as opposed to 30 days. And then um, also wavered all charges for home delivery and eliminated um, and streamlined the process to drug access such as uh, step therapy, which has been a long time common advocacy effort to make sure that patients get the drugs they need right away, the best drugs for the best cost. And so under this time period, th those changes have been made. The other focus, of course, is, is to meet the surge was um, the expansion of healthcare. And so the governor had created many executive orders so far that have waived licensing fees, staffing requirements, staffing ratios, and it expanded the opportunity for people to serve more quickly. Um, he also called for the California Health Corps 
which is asking for retirees and medical and nursing students to respond and step up to this disaster. The first day, they had 25,000 people sign up. To date, there's 80,000 people, which is, is heartening to hear that there's so many folks in California that want to step up and help. Um, he also provided um, uh, uh, our healthcare workers are on the front line. And so he gave them um, money to provide free hotel rooms so that they could keep their family safe, and also $100 million to provide childcare for essential healthcare workers. So um, as far as breast cancer, um, there's been a couple actions um, that have happened in California related to specifically a program that Coleman cares a lot about is the Every Woman Counts program. And um, on April 2nd, they released guidance that again, allowed for telephonic services, which hadn't been happening before. And the Every Woman Counts program is the breast and cervical treatment program for the uninsured and underinsured in the state of California that Coleman has been working for for many, many years and making sure that that program is stabilized and, and, and working and, and providing the services. So they opened up under COVID-19 um, that enrollment could happen over the telephone, which hadn't happened before. And also that any services that you could provide would be provided um, through the telephone. They also, um, as part of routine care, were basically asking people to postpone um, treatment and so on. But when it comes to actual um, triage of breast cancer patients, there and how we determine who um, uh, gets service and where they get service in this, in, in this, under this pandemic, there is a consortium um, that was put together, the Pandemic Breast Cancer Consortium of leading um, surgeons and uh, breast center programs and comprehensive care network and so on that put together uh, kind of guidelines um, for people to follow for breast cancer. Um, priority A, immediately life-threatening, of course. Priority B, it's um, non-critical, but a delay of six to eight weeks could impact the out outcome is, is the next priority. And then the bottom priority is folks that can wait until after this pandemic it, to, the, to the hospitals open up. And there's some good news on that. That's starting to happen as well. So as far as guidelines for breast cancer patients and how we triage them, depending on where they're going, um, there's some guidelines set up for that as well. So if, a, 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 a fo uh, if there's a hospital that, um, it's called phase one, where they don't, they don't have very, very many COVID-19 patients. They have plenty of um, supplies. Their ICU are not exhausted. Then um, the recommendation is that a surgery is restricted to breast cancer patients. Um, if su survivorship is compromised, if they don't get it within three months, and specifically looking at patients who um, are triple negative, um, they have biopsies that are likely mag malignant, and there's also a reoccurrence, and also patients who are going through chemo that need to finish their treatment. So, the, and also they're discouraging during this time, um, reconstruction surgeries should be deferred, um, and mastectomies, if, if, if at all avoided, to avoid during this time. Um, setting two, this is a place where there are COVID-19 patients. Um, it's not completely COVID-19, but they are there, um, and there's limited capacity on ventilators and ICUs. Th these surgeries are restricted for breast cancer patients if their um, outcome is compromised by a few days. So, and then the last, last, um, last phase is hospitals that are completely COVID, no ventilators, no supplies, no breast cancer patients should be there unless their um, survivorship is compromised by hours. So this is an urgent, urgent situation. So those are some guidelines that were set up by um, the consortium and also to make sure that, of course, all breast cancer treatment and diagnosis is done by a multidisciplinary team and also in a setting where there's a lot of folks looking at making decisions, of course, like we always um, recommend. Um, so where are we at right now as far as COVID? Um, COVID-19. Right now, today, there is 45 um, 
8,000 positive cases in the state of California. Um, Orange County, which I know many of you are, are from there, is the fourth and fourth um, for positive cases. Los Angeles is at 20,000. Riverside is at 33, San Diego 31, and Orange County is at 21, uh, 2198. Um, the cost of this, of course, has been devastating to nonprofits, to businesses, to hospitals, to all, all walks of life. Um, it, it, so, so where do we go from here? And how does this cost of this impact advocacy? And what opportunities do we have around advocacy because of the impact, economic impact? So the thing to remember too is because of our, our governor's early intermediate actions and the um, stay at home orders and um, shut down of services and so on and so forth. We did stabilize. Um, we have actually seen a little bit of a flatten in the curve. Um, the hospitalization, hospitalization rates are down 4%, 0.4%, excuse me, and ICU is down 1.2. So there is an uh, announcement was made by the governor to resume some delayed healthcare services that were put off hold during the COVID-19. And just this morning, the California Department of Public Health came out with guidance how we slowly start to open up our hospital systems. Because remember, when all of electric surgeries and all that stuff shut down, well, that means that the hospitals shut all that down too. They can't just turn around and revamp that. So it's gonna take some time to get back. But the, the point is we are getting back to providing more services at the healthcare um, level. So th it's good. Um, the other thing is, though, we want to make sure that any um, uh, opening up of the system doesn't restart up the whole process again, because we are not immunity free. We are not, we don't have immunity in California. So we need to be careful. We are going to open up, but it's going to be slow. Um, and the thing to look at from the economic point of view it's, it's astronomical what this is gonna cost. I participated on a call on March 26 with Covered California, and they estimated at that time that the COVID-19 was gonna cost $1.2 trillion just in the first year. And also from um, our commercial and marketed from rating from 34 billion to $251 billion for testing, treatment, and care of COVID-19. So, and also um, yesterday there was a special assembly hearing along with those costs looking at unemployment, which is estimated to be between 12 and 15% in California. Um, there's been $4 billion of unemployment gone out to 4 million people. Uh, we can't maintain that. Um, there is some, um, you know, the unemployment money is held into a trust that's going to become um, insolvent. Federal loans are out there, but we can't completely depend on that. So. Also, um, there is a little bit of good news. Uh, the forecast says, um, and this was an assembly hearing yesterday, that it'll take us about 18 months to recover. And we should see a quicker recovery than we did from the 2008-2009 recession. Those industries that have been hit the hardest are retail, which will probably have some kind of permanent shrinkage. It's not gonna look the same. And also travel and personal services. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, one of the things that um, is doing well and will continue to do well is, is, is the technology industry because we are going to be looking at doing work in a different way for a while. So in order to open up, um, the governor has released some standards that we need to meet to get to that point. Um, and again, this is all stuff that's being discussed in the legislature right now and, and advocacy is important to this. Um, there are six critical factors. Um, the first one, and of course he's basing this on, on science and data-driven framework, not politics. This is about making sure that we keep California safe, but we also have to open up to stimulate the economy and to, to, to move forward through this. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm in my home. So uh, uh, the first, factor is the ability to monitor and uh, test 
And I do have some good news on that. Uh, as I mentioned, I was on a call this morning with the California Department of Public Health and the governor put together a task force. And when we originally started, we were only testing like a thousand or so folks a, a day. And the goal was to get up to 25,000. We are now at that point. We are testing 25,000 people a day. Um, the California, Public, Public, California Department of Public Health is opening up 80 centers across the state, leaving that up to the counties to decide where the biggest need is. And they're already scheduling those in Merced and Humboldt and so on, some of your rural counties that don't have the facility. The second um, criteria to open up the back open California is to be able to prevent um, infection for people who are at risk. And of course, we're seeing a lot of that with our skilled nursing facilities and um, our residential care facilities for um, seniors. We also have to be able to handle the surge that can happen for the hospital and healthcare systems, and we're getting to that point. Um, we have to, to be able to develop therapeutics to, to meet the, the demand. Um, the ability for businesses, schools, and childcare facilities to support this Physical, uh, physical distancing. So how do we look at when we open things up, how are we gonna be able to, to handle that um, distancing that needs to be in place? And then also um, criteria that stay at orders can be reinstituted at any time. Um, so for the political process, it's been interesting. As I had mentioned, they, they, they left um, in March and said, we'll be back in the fourth, uh, May 4th. The assembly is coming back on May 4th. The Senate's not so sure. The Senate is kind of going back and forth on whether or not it's safe. Um, there's concern with our senior members of the legislature, whether they should be back in the building. And what it's gonna look like is much different. They're allowing one member and one staff. Everyone who walks into the Capitol has to be tested. They're escorted to um, a hearing room. There's only two rooms in the Capitol that can accommodate hearings and also have social distancing at the same time. Uh, so far, I've watched about three or four special sessions and the members have masks on, there's coverage on the microphones, only the sponsors of the bills are allowed in the room, all public comment is done through the telephone. Um, we, during this time, and, the, and so lobbying doesn't stop, there's still a lot of bills and there's a lot of action and obviously the budget is a big concern. And being on the healthcare team, our clients were definitely impacted by this, by this um, pandemic. And so there's a lot of advocacy that still needed to take place. And we have found that the legislature was very, legislature was very open to telephone meetings, to virtual meetings, very accessible. We actually held virtual lobby days with some of our clients. And the, um, the legislature were very excited to hear from us they wanted an update, they wanted to know what's happening out there. And so there is accessibility and there's opportunity for you locally to reach out to your legislators. They're there and the staff is there and they're working. Um, they're just doing it remotely. Um, so yesterday, as I mentioned, there was a hearing focusing on COVID-19 and the recovery. 11 members participated in the hearing and all the panelists and also the public was all done through video. So it's, it's working. Um, the biggest thing we have to worry about right now is the budget. So um, there is a, traditionally a May revise that's done by the legislature and handed over to the governor. But if you remember, our state taxes were not due until July 15th. So they're kind of working blindly, right? We won't know what the state revenues are until after those taxes come in. So we're probably looking at as another special session, where we will be looking at a special session to look at the budget again. And, and there is a huge amount of issues. Uh, people are concerned about um, how do we open up businesses without protection gear? How do dentists work without protection gear? You know, dentists stopped working. Um, you know, a lot of the healthcare arena was impacted by negatively of this. And how do we take care of those and make sure that our dentists don't disappear or that our healthcare workers don't disappear? And how are they going to be protected? So, and also looking at the necessity of childcare for folks uh, because their schools are still shut down and I'm not sure when those are going to open up again. Um, so, as as you know, the conversations continue and flow. Keep in mind, this is all up for change. This is all flexible. 
this is all, and we, we have to be nimble. And these executive orders that the governor has done have made us nimble as far as the healthcare arena and businesses. As you know, there were lax um, changes on student loans and, and um, mortgage companies. And so there's been some uh, necessity to, to make us flexible, but we also have to see how we're going to open. I was on a call again this morning, as I mentioned, that the opening up of California is going to look very different um, and it's going to be slow, but it, we will get there. Um, the thing that's really important for us to remember is from an advocacy point of view is that it never stops. There's always things that need to be taken care of. There's always voices that need to be heard as breast cancer patients, as uh, uh, those at Coleman that's serving the underserved we have to make sure that they're taken care of and they're looked out for. And with this um, economic recession that's coming because of COVID-19, some of those programs that we worked so hard for over the last 10 years and, and put so much effort into could be compromised. And so your voice as far as common advocacy is really important that we're still engaged and we're still involved and we're still looking out for those that need the help the most. Um, I, I, I want to finally say, and we'll probably going to open up questions, but I just want to say thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for um, doing the right thing, Coleman. We really appreciate this opportunity, and uh, please, everyone, stay safe and, and healthy. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was uh, incredibly interesting, and and you know, for me, it was it was. And we don't have any questions from our, our Facebook uh, audience. So if, if people have questions, please put them in the chat because we want to get them to Kelly while, while we have her still on the line. Uh, but I think it was uh, great to hear that some barriers have been removed uh, for patients in particular around access to medications. That's, that's so critical. Uh, but I think for, for me, just hearing what you were saying at the end, uh, because it's true, despite all that's going on, uh, breast cancer, unfortunately, is not stopped in its tracks, and uh, there are still a, a ton of need, and the gains that have been made at the advocacy level are now uh, potentially threatened uh, because of the budget cuts. And so um, if, if we're saying people need to still use their voice, what would you recommend? Like, what should they do? What are some, like, really key action steps that anybody can take to help pr uh, protect the breast health safety net? Well, one of the things is, is to keep informed and, and, you know, it can be overwhelming. Um, a plethora of, of information is out there. But if I had to recommend a couple sites to, to be aware of what's happening and what access to services you have, it's the California Dep uh, Department of Public Health. Just Google that and they have a COVID-19 pages. They have a list of everything that's happening, where testing sites are, what ha what's happening with equipment, what's happening with health facilities, what are the guidances for um, services, and, and what's gonna happen as far as, as we slowly reopen our hospitals. They're the ones that are making that guidance. Um, it was told to us today that as the governor makes the announcements, there will be guidance available to that. So there's lots of information on that site. The other one is the governor's site um, is COVID-19, or California COVID-19, um, dot org, and that is a site specifically just for this, this information. Um, as far as getting engaged and staying involved, um, your local legislators are holding town hall meetings. Um, a lot of them are virtual conferences and or video conferences and informing folks locally what is happening as far as the latest guidelines on masks or plastic bags or whatever it is. Um, you know, politics is local. And there, it's been an interesting dichotomy to see kind of the wrestling of, of um, management through feds, through state, through local. Your local public officials have the resources when it comes to what your guidance is in your own community. The state, uh, the governor is working with all of the mayors and the local officials to make sure that that is, is happening and there's a lot of communication. But as I mentioned a few times, a lot of these processes are, hope, are turned right over to the counties and the counties are providing those services. So pay attention to who your local legislators are and what are they doing? Are they having tele, are they having tele uh, video conferencing? I know a lot of them are and they're keep trying to keep people informed on 
school systems, on economic system, you know, the economy, and also what's happening in the healthcare arena. And oftentimes they'll have, um, you know, experts from your local hospitals talking about what's available. And there's always Q&A um, for all of these so you can ask questions and be involved. That's great. And we'll be sure to add to the comanoc.org backslash COVID-19 page some of these resources that you just shared, Kelly. So thank you so much. And we do have a question from the Facebook audience, and that is, what legislation might be under consideration for the future? Well, um, right now, it's kind of interesting. Um, they're, they're asking legislators, because the, the priority right now, of course, is, is the budget, right? and COVID-19. So in the beginning of the year, there was 2000 bills. Well, that's not gonna happen. And so the legislators are being asked by the committee chairs to narrow down their priorities as much as possible to only bills that have to do with COVID-19. And that's right now. And so um, we're at Political Solutions, we're monitoring and tracking all of the bills that are related to COVID-19 and all the bills that are still active. But we are seeing that some of the things that we were working on are, are getting dropped because they're not specific. Moving forward, a big action is going to be, uh, from Coleman's perspective, is making sure that the Every Woman Counts program is here, viable, and, and, and working. Because um, it's, you know, there's going to be even more folks that are going to need services because of the economy, right? And so that is, has always been a huge issue. And will continue to be a whole huge issue for for Coleman um, uh, locally and the statewide. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kelly. This has been incredibly informative, and I know that you know you're in Sacramento. You're in the heart of it. So just you carving out some time for us means a lot. And uh, for anyone, if there are any questions that people have after this. Uh, please uh, be in touch with uh, Coleman Orange County team, and we'll make sure that if we can't answer them, that um, Kelly, can we come to you and, and bring you some more questions and get some answers? Absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> yeah. Anytime. Okay. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much and just stay safe and be well. Thank you. You too. And thank you for everybody for being here today. Thanks Bye -bye. everyone. Take care.